good morning. Um, I decided to change the title of my presentation. I went for thinking outside of the bounding box, assessing representations of age, race, class, and gender in the illustrations of historical children's literature from 1800 until 1940. And why did I do so? Because I think it is paramount that we um, pay more attention to the decision-making processes that go along research projects, especially in the digital humanities. Um, why? Because um, in the humanities, we're always working with inherent uncertainty, um, and we're looking for interpretive and critical perspectives rather than stone-cold facts or hard truths or objective truths, as you could call it. Um, in the digital humanities, um, we're using a lot of tools that were created in different scientific fields. Um, and due to those tools being developed there, we're also indebted, as Ava Masson has highlighted, to, their, to the positivist traditions that informed the creation of those tools. If you look at the limits of the database, for example, um, not that a database is a tool, but that's also something that we're using where you have those very clear-cut um, things where you're looking, um, where you have unambiguous enumerations, for example, where you need clear labels, where you need definite data values, because everything else is simply not in the data set. And, um, so there, the uncertainty um, that we're presented with in the humanities might provide or might cause friction. Um, and in this talk, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about those friction, the moments where friction arises and which decisions we have made um, when dealing with this doubt or uncertainty. Um, so as a brief introduction, in my project, I'm studying representations in historical children's literature. And why am I doing so? Because there has been an emotional and recurrent debate on what to do with literature that presents problematic worldviews. Um, those are some of the headlines, but only a small section of the headlines that are um, that can be found in um, Anglo in the Anglo-Saxon world, but also in Flanders, where I come from, or the Netherlands. Um, and this debate is very emotional, but it's not always found on actual or found on actual research, because especially if you're looking at historical children's literature, we simply do not know what actually happens within the books. We've studied some canonical works, such as Red Riding Hood and Robinson Crusoe, but everything else that is inside of the archive has simply not been studied. So then you can say that everything was racist or everything was sexist, and you can have all of those discussions, but... Um, that doesn't work very well if you don't know what is taking place. And, and those statements, such as everything was racist, have also been debunked by various scholars. There were already anti-racist voices. They were simply not part of the canon and have been lost to time, as it were. Um, so in my research project, I'm trying to provide that first overview using computational or digital methods. Um, on a corpus of a 1,000 um, Dutch language children's books, um, published between 1800 and 1940, so that we can then point scholars toward where more research might be needed. Um, and in the first step of that research project, um, we're annotating the human characters in the illustrations of the children's literature. And there we take an intersectional approach. So we, we put bounding boxes around the characters, and then we annotate them for age, race, class, and gender. And bias there is operationalized as an over or under representation. So if certain features would co-occur more frequently than others, then you could say that there's a certain type of bias. Um, yes. Um, and then if we're talking about uncertainty, it might, be, it might be useful to divide that into ontological doubt, or logical uncertainty, and epistemic doubt. Um, and the first thing, so ontological doubt, is about the boundaries themselves. If you want to label things, then you also need to decide which labels to use, but that's the decision. Um, and in this talk, we're, we'll focus on ontological doubt. Right. Um, so the labels we're using, um, if you remember, age, race, class, and gender, if you want to have something meaningful to say about those um, categories, then you need to also put people into certain groups to have um, something to say. Um, but the way you do that, the labels you put on those characters are not predetermined. They're not natural categories. Um, and so we decided how to, or which labels to use, and that also influences the results we will get at the end. Oh, sorry. So I think it's important to also take a moment to talk about why we decided on certain labels. If, you, if you're talking about age, for example, um, you could go for actual age ranges. You could say, okay, we'll, we'll have a group of 
characters that are from zero years old to 10 years old and then go from there. You could also um, decide to go for groups and that's what we did in the end so that you have younger, um, middle and then older. Um, but every decision you make influences what you get in the end. Uh, another thing is that we instructed our annotators to um, always select the older category when they were in doubt. Um, but that also makes sure that we have different um, groupings and different numbers within those groups. Um, if, if we're talking about race, and that might be an even more controversial um, label, um, then we also made a lot of decisions. And the first decision is to actually talk about race. Um, if, if you're looking at um, a, a Dutch or German-speaking con context, then talking about ras or rasse um, feels very uncomfortable, uncomfortable because it reminds us of um, things from the Second World War, for example, and you almost feel bad for even using the term, but race is not the same as ethnicity. Ethnicity has more to do with cultures and with traditions, and race has to do with physical and visual um, um, features that we then put values on. Um, so it is also a social construct. It's very much a social construct, but it's a, it's a different one. And if we want to go against the colorblindness that is so present in, in um, a Dutch-speaking context, then we need to also name those things. So that's why I decided to go for race. Um, but then if you've decided on race, you still need to have labels. And I was recently at a workshop and I asked people, how would you label um, people in this category? And then they said, maybe you could go for continents or, or colors. Or someone even said, in computer vision, you have a Fitzpatrick scale of skin tone. Um, but for illustrations, a lot of those things don't work. A lot of the characters don't hail from actual existing countries. Um, if you're looking at continents, for example, you have a lot of different people inside of continents. And if you're looking at skin tones, the illustrations are colored, so that wouldn't work either. Um, and in the end, we decided to go for white versus non-white. And that might also seem problematic because their whiteness is centered again. But I think in those debates, um, the um, non-whiteness or, or whiteness is often the unmarked category, the thing that is neutral, the thing where we start from. And I think it would um, be very, um, very needed and interesting to, to make whiteness the marked category, to talk about how that is socially constructed as well. And that's why we decided to oppose whiteness to non-whiteness. Um, but then if you're annotating this, you come across things such as blackface, for example, where white characters are dressing up as non-white characters. How do you label this? Is this then um, saying something about representation of whiteness or about non-whiteness? All of those things, how you put that in your database also influence your results at the end. For class, we had a different problem where the visual markers were often very hard to interpret, um, especially in for the historical data, we simply did not know where to put people. So we've decided to limit um, ourselves to extreme cases. Royal attire, for example, of this king would be very uh, much be higher class. And a beggar in the streets would be lower class. But everything in between, we've decided to just pull under middle class. Um, but that also influences what we can say at the end about middle class. Because if you pull everything there, then it wouldn't be um, sound research and then have um, very explicit statements about how middle class is represented. And as a last one, we have gender, where we went for um, predominantly male and predominantly female as a binary. Um, and there you could also wonder, but gender is not a binary in the real world. How can you categorize it as such here? Um, but here again, I would focus on the constructedness of that binary. And that's exactly what we're studying, how that binarity is constructed through things such as children's literature. So that's also what we're focusing on. And similar to the blackface issue, here you would have cross-dressing, for example. How do you account for that? Um, and then if you go to the actual illustrations, you have a new problem. So who do you actually annotate? So in the front, the, the people are fairly visible, and you can clearly put a bounding box. But if you go towards the back, um, those people are merely doodles. So do you also put a bounding box? How, how insightful is that? And where do you stop? Where do you draw the distinction between what you annotate and what you don't? Um, and then on a second level, so this is while annotating, but then in the, in the next step, we will have to do statistical analysis. And there you could wonder, OK, but 
is every bounding box equal? If you have, for example, a representation of an exotic tribe where 50 non-white characters are depicted, is that then equal to 50 illustrations of a white protagonist? Um, you could say, yeah, we have 50 white and 50 non-white characters, so everything is equal, but it doesn't work that way. So you have to take into account things like the size of the bounding box, um, the number of bounding boxes in an illustration, also the centrality. Is, is a character placed centrally in the picture, or is it part of the margins? Is it a peripheral, peripheral thing? Um, so all of those things are decision, decisions that influence what we will get out of our research at the end and what we'll communicate. And that's something that I wanted to draw attention to. Um, and also, in the discussion, I would encourage you to think about the decisions that we have made, how they could be improved, how they could be different, because um, no decision is perfect, but also the decisions that you make for your research projects and how they influence the way your research takes shape at the end. Thank you very much.